Welcome to the official tennis.com podcast featuring professional coach and community leader, Kamal Murray. Welcome to the tennis.com podcast. I am your host, Kamal Murray, and we are here with somebody that I call a friend, a friendly face, uh, was always a friendly face to me on tour uh, when I was sort of a fresh out of fish out of water and kind of green uh, and looking for somebody to talk to, trying to find somebody at the bar to, you know, decompress with. Um, he spent nine years on tour uh, as a WTA supervisor. Uh, and we'll get into how that happened because that's sort of improbable. And then uh, now works for a company, um, you know, which we'll talk about as well. So the technology company uh, that's just diving into tennis. His name is Yannick Yoshizawa. Yannick, welcome to the show. Hi, Kamal. Thank you. Thanks for the, the nice introduction. I like that friend to say. So appreciate you you're having me here. Well, you had to be a friendly face because you were WTA player relations for a long time. So, you know, the players walk in your office with a list of complaints. You know, you got to kind of take it up with a smile, right? And sort of <laughs> respond or communicate that up the, two, up, up the food chain. But tell me how you got into this sport because I think, you know, when I think of WTA tour, I think it's, you know, naturally predominantly run by you know, a lot of us are, are, you know, run by women, right? And I mean, obviously we got Steve Simon as the CEO. What do you think of tour supervisor, player relations, uh, the media, um, it's primarily women. So how did you get into this? Tell us about your background in tennis and how it led into this. Yeah, um, no, uh, well, I think for me, you know, I grew up playing tennis. I'm from Brazil originally. Um, played tennis my whole life as a junior. Went on to come to the United States to play college tennis at the University of South Florida uh, without really knowing, you know, what was going to happen after. Um, and as it came in on my fourth year, playing for the school and starting to figure out, okay, oh my gosh, you know, what's next? You know, I played a couple of pro events during summers, but I knew that one, I didn't have the level, I guess, but two, that my preference uh, is, is starting to change. And, um, you know, I think a little bit of luck, a little bit of uh, connections. Uh, I, you know, graduated from University of South Florida that is in Tampa. The WTA, which I didn't really know, it was in St. Petersburg at the headquarters until I graduated. And, you know, I graduated with a finance and management degree and they had a finance internship open, uh, unpaid, uh, you know, and as basically as an international student, you, you know, I guess I got lucky because it was something that I wanted to do, but I also, um, you know, I didn't really care at that point. So I started WT as a finance intern there for three months. Um, you know, and then luckily, as an international student, you know, you have one year to work and then you better get, quote unquote, a job that sponsors you to allow you to stay in the U.S. or you got to go home. Um, so yeah, I was very fortunate that after my three month internship, uh, the WTA offered me a job and allowed me to stay uh, for another nine years within the company. So it was a long ride after those three months. Now, let me ask you this, because like you're like the second or third person I've heard about got getting their start, playing college tennis and getting their start in like an unpaid internship, which I think in today's world is phenomenal because these kids today will not do that, right? They want to get paid right away. Yeah. Um, first, were you at USF? Because I played at Florida and then we played South Florida, but I was in the Stephen Capriati era. Were, were you yeah. in the Stephen Capriati era? Uh, no, I would say a little bit later. I'm not yeah. going to say how far later, but later. Yeah, because I remember we went and played USF, and Stephen Capriati had a green Range Rover. And I said, ooh, it pays to be <laughs> Jennifer's little brother. Boy, I swear, a Range Rover in college. I, that is, <laughs> he pulled up to the courts, and I'm like, either has, like, dark um, eyelashes, or he's got on eye makeup, one or the other. But it was two things I remember was like, man, this thing could get on eye makeup, right? And then, and then the green Range Rover. So that's... That's my South Florida story. Uh, yeah, no, no Range Rover uh, during my time. Uh, we're still green for sure, but yeah, I definitely missed that point. So you started as a finance intern, and then where did you go? Because there's 
you know, I think when I think of tour, I think of, you know, media relations, you think of, you know, the person that walks on court and tells the player, hey, you got to do press. And the player looks at him and says, I don't want to do press, right? Um, then you got tour supervisors, you got lines, people, umps. Tell me sort of after your, your finance internship, where you go from there in the tour. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I was very fortunate that I was able to do a little bit of everything. Uh, you know, so I stayed actually in the finance department for two years, uh, finance and, and admin, which actually had nothing to do with what you just said about tennis and why people see it. But it was great because I learned a lot on the business side of, of the tour and how it operates, what it takes, you know, to actually run financially and business oriented. Um, then at that point, you know, I wanted to get a little bit more involved on this side where people see it. Um, but my transition was that I worked on the operations uh, department, which it takes a lot of the entries, withdrawals, all the rules. Um, you know, so that was very, again, on the back end where you see, you know, all the players entering the tournament, the withdrawings, why not getting the quotes from the agents, getting calls from the coaches, how much are they going to get fined and, you know, and all those uh, fun stuff, which, you know, continue to intrigue me. Okay. You know, hopefully the next step will be to actually be at the tournaments, right? Facing those people, which, you know, like actually growing up, you see it and you want to either be there or, you know, be part of it. And, you know, I think I had a, a great chance where the WTA allowed me to start as a player relations, which basically you are there to be the player's voice within the tour. And also, you travel a lot to the tournaments, uh, be there for, you know, just talking to players about new rules coming in, new businesses coming into the WTA, getting their feedback and portraying back to the management of the WTA to hear, okay, what are the players thinking? Uh, and then after that, which was my final two years and a half at the WTA, I went on to be a tour supervisor, uh, which then, you know, it's more on the aspect of uh, doing the schedules, uh, you know, making sure that the tournaments are up to a standard, uh, dealing with uh, players, coaches, agents, uh, which has definitely brought me a lot of learnings in life and great networks such as uh, yourself. Well, let me ask you this, because when I view, you know, like college tennis players, right? I think all of us, we all go out and we try to play a few tournaments and, and then that doesn't work out for us. And then we try to find a job in tennis. And for me, it was like, how do I delay entry into the real world? Like, how do I like not move to New York, work for Goldman Sachs, work 18 hours a day, go to sleep, do it all over again. How can I kind of like take baby steps into the real world? And because tennis is such a bubble, right? And it's such a friendly sort of good old boys net fraternity, right? Um, yeah. Was that your thing? It was like, yeah, I kind of could go into traditional finance, but I'm trying to avoid the real world. You know what I mean? Was it, if you're being honest with yourself, was it some of that? Yeah, uh, <laughs> I mean, a hundred percent actually hit the nail in the head. Uh, I actually, my last semester in school, I did an internship on an investment banking, a small investment banking in Tampa. Um, so I got a little of that feeling. Uh, and then I guess just my, my DNA wasn't there uh, just from, you know, how people, their mindsets are and, you know, like super, let's say financial driven at that point, but also super competitive. And then, which is very different, I think, I wouldn't say competitive in a way that like you create relationships such as sports do, um, you know, and I think that's the part where I felt like, wow, I, I guess I wanted to delay. If I ever have to go into that, into a full time, I wanted to delay as much as possible. And then I guess this is the part where I felt that I just fell in the right place where the WTA you know, which is a tennis uh, company, they were looking for a finance intern, which was my major at that point. So I guess I didn't even think about when I was doing a finance major that my chances of going into tennis would be smaller than if I did a more broader, uh, because I thought that I wanted to work in banking uh, mm -hmm. at that point. But I guess I was lucky enough that I got that experience to prove that I wanted to be in sports. So let me ask you this, because I've run three WTA tournaments, two ATP events, and 
without the subsidy from the WTA, right? We wouldn't have made money. Well, I mean, we didn't make money anyway, right? It was a break-even business at best. Uh, how many of you know, and people always talk about why don't we have more events in the States, right? Or why do events show up in one location and then they leave and go to another location, right? And I figure, you know, you show up in Lexington, maybe you, you know, you do it one time, it sounds cool to have Serena come to live, but if it, at the end of the day, no one's in business to make money and have like a really expensive party, right? So A, what percentage of the tournaments make money? And B, looking back, how do we create more events that are able to sustain? Yeah, now that's a, that's a million dollar question here, Come on, If we resolve this today, uh, <laughs> you know, I think we'll be able to create our own tour. Uh, you know, I think that there's a couple layers to that question. Uh, I don't have the financials or every single tournament, uh, but I would say I, I would assume it's less than half uh, that, you know, can make money out of the actual events in itself. Um, and I think to your question, you know, how can it become more sustainable, uh, which I think tennis is somewhat heading that which, you know, fan engagement, taking the fans as well as a priority, you know, how could you better and also the players, right? Uh, and involving more the players and the fans to be able to create that needs. You know, I think tennis, it's, the, it's one of the most popular sports in the world, but it's very dependent on ticket sales still. Uh, you know, and it's not if you go and look into all these other sports, the American football, baseball, basketball, soccer, the majority of their revenue comes from digital, um, you know, revenues, which tennis hasn't cracked that yet, um, you know, for multiple, I think, reasons to this. But I think that it's, there has been a more, let's say, focus in this aspect, which, you know, I think tennis will be able to do that. And then that goes back to the events because then their products can be exposed to, you know, more people, which then the revenue comes. It's not only dependent on ticket revenue, right? Because if you go and look, especially I think with this new generation, right? Uh, it's very tough for someone to be engaged for six, seven hours of a one day event, much less or even one match that might take three hours, right? <laughs> So I think it's just this different things that are happening in tennis that, okay, like how can you engage this whole new uh, generation, uh, which I think all sports have, you know, been trying to figure it out, but tennis because of the traditionalism and the lack of that digital aspect has having a, like a tougher time. But at the same time, within that, I think there's a lot of opportunities. Now, when you say digital, you're not only talking about social media, but are you also talking about TV? Because I think, you know, like when you think about one of the challenges, the benefit, the, the great thing about tennis that is global. I mean, it travels from region to region. You know, you get the Asian swing in the, in the fall. You got uh, the European swing. You got London, French Open, right? You Australian Open the first quarter of the year. I mean, you really touch the entire world. Challenge is some of these tournaments happen when people are sleeping in the U.S., right, which is sort of the biggest market, right, Madison Avenue, New York, that kind of thing. So is that what you're talking about on how we, where the NBA is always happening during a time people are awake, people are watching? Um, is that what you're talking about in terms of, you know, tapping into the digital opportunities or is it more social media? No, no, I, I think it starts with what you just said, you know, I think TV or streaming services, right? Uh, and then, yes, you know, I think there is that aspect of uh, being able to capitalize on the local market uh, more, uh, but also at the same time, not only, you know, having live matches that people, but like, how do you create, you know, highlights that are being able to distribute it through different streaming services, you know, through TV and get that exposure uh, more and more, uh, because I think, as you said, and that's, one of the hardest thing in tennis because it's individual. So you're cheering for that one player that might not be playing every single tournament, right? So I think there's all these different challenges, but uh, again, at the same time, there's beautiful opportunities. It's just 
there's multiple ways that I'm sure as you, you know, being involved in tennis, you have been exposed to 50 different ideas on how the structure of tournaments and, you know, level tiers, players, and so on can be, uh, because there needs to be, um, I guess, a concrete way for me as a fan to watch and not get confused, right? Sometimes it's hard to see there's three tournaments going on and then top 20 players are playing in different parts of the region. And you're like, for me, if I'm not a huge fan of tennis, but I like to watch, I'll be confused, right? Yeah, and I think one of the things, uh, you know, like I've got, you know, I was in tennis and obviously have friends and supporters when I'm coaching, they like, like to keep up and watch. But one of the things I think we've started to do better is to be able to tell the story of a match in 15 minutes. So like if I'm scouting like, you know, my player's next opponent, I'm going to go on YouTube and I'm not probably not going to watch, you know, like the, the, the kiss of death is when I pull up a YouTube video and the only video is two hours and 21 minutes. I'm like, yeah, I'm going to watch all two hours, right? But, every, yeah. but I think the tour has gotten better on trying to tell the story of the match Mm-hmm. within 15 minutes of video right and i think yes. there is a fan base let's say you know if i got i got you know like four of my best friends playing the nba right they're not gonna watch what happened in beijing right but they will watch the story of the match and i'll be like you know i talked to them like oh man how'd it go well i saw what happened in that five four i'm like oh okay you know so they they kind of can get into the match if it's told right right mm-hmm. if it's the right story uh and if it's told concisely conversely as a coach the person that's choosing the clips, if I'm using that clip for scouting, that could be the wrong clips I want to see. Like that could be like yeah. the wrong story of the match. And I've mm-hmm. had been a few times where the full match wasn't available, and I'm watching the highlights. And I'm like, Ooh, this is not happening the way that you know what I mean. So that that that's yeah. sort of tricky. But I, I understand what you're saying in terms of. So then, let's stay on TV for one second. Um. One of the things I think the fan doesn't realize, right? Because one of the fan frustrations is not knowing what time the player is going to play, right? And as a in your position as tour supervisor or tournament supervisor, right? You you had to communicate with TV and tennis channel to say who do you want to play at what time. Talk a little bit about that process because I think the average fan has no idea why people got assigned to what courts. And what order and why they, they order the matches the way they are. Talk to us about that, just because I think it's helpful to build fans if we educate them on the process. Yeah. Yeah, no, um, that's a very complicated process in a way. Uh, but at the same time, you know, I think it's it's important, as you said. So there is multiple stakeholders, right, into making a schedule of a tournament. Television, because of the revenue side of it, has a big part to it. But also you as a tour supervisor, your whole job there is to keep fairness, right? So there is, of course, the part of the TV. There is the part of the tournaments in itself, because television might have someone who they want on center for different than the tournament who might have a local star. And then there are the players themselves, right? Because you've got to consider their injuries, you know, if they're coming from a tournament, you know, who is going to play against who if they're playing singles and doubles. So there's multiple facets <clears throat> to that decision. Um, so usually, you know, there is multiple meetings uh, across the day, you know, basically to grab, okay, these are television requests. These are the tournament requests. These are how the players are and where they're at, right? And then I'm going to see it here where to fit in. So basically it's a puzzle, right? That you need to construct in the best of your abilities to quote unquote, try to maximize everyone. But, you know, as I always said, in the end of the day, you can never make everyone happy, right? There's always gonna be someone there who will not get what they wanted. Um, you know, and I think that's the part of the being able to communicate but also, you know, have that also education part to everyone, right? Like having the ability to educate television about the players and the tournament, same thing with the tournament and educating the players themselves to understand, hey, just what we were talking about, you know, how do we exponentiate 
you know, the tennis show on another level, it's understanding that, okay, this is prime time. There will be times that, you know, and it's, and it's all about communicating, you know, how the player should prepare. And, you know, as a coach, you know, if you knew that your player will be playing a night session two days before, it's better than just getting to know two hours before, right? So now go deep into the TV. Go, go Just go be clear on the TV part, because I think the way I think it works is you know, if we're eight hours ahead, right? We're in London mm-hmm. or whatever like that, right? Yeah. Then we want to let America wake up. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So we put the Americans on later in the day. Yeah. Right? The American players, there's an American star. We play them later in the day. Yeah. Right? So because we, you know, Tennis Channel says we got to wait till California wakes up so that they yeah. can see this player that's from California, right? Yeah. Then the player comes to you and says, don't play me last. I don't <laughs> play well at night. Right. Yeah. And then the coach comes to you and says, can we play first? <laughs> because it's supposed to rain and I don't want to be stuck in this rain delay. Right. Yeah. Is that, that's what you're talking about. Right. So TV sort of requests based on time zone. Right? Yes. And, and it goes also time zones. And, you know, and before every event, there is what we call a match schedule plan. Right. Where there are already slots that, you know, which television channel is going to show that match, right? Because sometimes tennis channel might not show every single match of that tournament, but they have two slots, which they will be thinking about their time zone, right? So if the tournament's in Europe, I'm like, okay, I'm going to get the last two matches because those are the matches that most people will watch in the United States. Therefore, now I hope that it's Americans that will play on those matches, right? And mm-hmm. that's sort of the thing because it's hard because you only see the draw a day before you need to start making schedule, right? Therefore, like you need to really think on your toes. It's not that the draw is made two weeks before right. and then you can plan everything on. Right, right. So you've obviously, as a tour supervisor, you've had a chance to see a lot of a lot of tournaments, right? You spend, what, 38 weeks on the road? <laughs> um, hard to have a family, hard to have kids, that kind of thing. Tell me about one of the most memorable matches you got a chance to see. Oh, uh, I think I'll actually most memorable matches, I think with, with everything that happened, it was in Montreal 2019 uh, off the final of, I, I, I can't remember if you were still with Sloan, but it was Simona and Sloan in the final. Oh, best women's um, match of that year, 2018. 2018? Best- best women's match of that year yeah that was it was it was just crazy because that event in itself it was actually one of you know my first year as a tour soup you know so was there as an assistant and everything happened where the tour soup had to leave you know and then uh, me communicating you know as a young supervisor with the simona the loans and coaches and the agents and everything and then, you know, there was rain for like two days, basically at the tournament. So like Simone and I think Sloan, they played two days, they played two matches each yes. uh, every day. And then it got to the Sunday and it was just a beautiful day. The stadium was packed and, you know, it was a three setter where both of the players were just playing unbelievable tennis uh you know and it was yeah so therefore like i think the whole tournament and everything that happened to finish in that note uh it was uh, very memorable for me uh and then you know i guess hopefully that as you saw it as you know a coach and you know fans the best match you know of that year but that was just incredible of that cherry on the cake yeah, no, that was that was crazy. I think what I remember looking at my boy OG, who was coaching with me at the time, and the way that they were fighting, they were both playing like good tennis all week, but the way that they were just going at it, like just boxing. Yeah. And, you know, like I remember at one time it was a long point, and both of the players kneeled down on the ground, like squatted down on the ground, holding on to the rackets, just looking at each other. Yeah. Right? It was yeah, like, I remember like, that. Remember that? Yeah, really. Really, I was like, Sloan, she's going to tap out. Come on, stay with her. She's going to tap out. She's going to yeah. tap out. Uh, and I looked at OG. I was like, man, I said, you got to love this. I said, they are like going 
added, win or lose or going out. But I agree. That, that was the probably one of the best, best tennis match I've been ever been a part of. But I think of that year, yeah, instant classic. I mean, that was just yeah, amazing. Um, and what about wild rides, right? Because you see tournaments, you see like these runs by improbable, you know, like just improbable situations. Like I remember Caroline Garcia's run in Beijing where she went always to the finals and qualified for the year. That to me was like, I didn't see that coming, right? It was just sort of a wild ride. What tournaments were you souping, right? Being a, being a supervisor where you from start to finish was like, oh, wow, I just saw like history unfold. <laughs> Man, I, I think that's, that was um, really hard. I think from my side um, that I can remember, you know, um, it was 20, 2020, yeah, 2020 during COVID where, you know, events were just coming back in Strasbourg. So it's a 250 actually in France, you know, everything was still very tough. Um, and I remember, you know, like that match, there was this girl called Diana Yastremska. I know which a lot of people didn't know about her at that point still, you know, and then she just comes out and, you know, beats Sabalenka, uh, I believe as well she did Svitolina, you know, so like she just has this amazing run and, uh, you know, like she basically, you know, wins the tournament and uh, you just see it, this girl, like she was, I think at that point, 18 or 17, uh, you know, of these younger players that has a huge potential, you know, which I think a, probably a lot of people don't know about her. Uh, but I think for me, that was just very memorable because, you know, you see her and her mom, a coach, and just, uh, you know, as a teenager is still, you know, winning those type of tournaments at that age, it has to be something that like, it just blows your mind and how do you deal with that? You know, so I think for me, it was just seeing that, you know, which maybe in five years you'll see you know like her exploding you know into a top 10 and stuff like that but for me it's still to unfold um but but yeah i think for me that was one big event that i saw a player such as that unfolding yeah that's um i remember that <laughs> i remember that and then i was wondering like because when you see that it happen the week before a slam it's yeah. almost like the curse right it's almost like all right you just won a tournament you stayed in that city longer than anybody else. Oh. You got to the slam late, oh. right? Or the day before, or whatever. You asked for a late start, but in the slam, you don't get to, you don't get the late start because top half play yeah. at one time, bottom half. So depending on what half you get there, yeah, you gotta be ready to play right away. Yeah. And I was like, is she gonna go for the first round curse? Right? <laughs> Where yeah. and usually we saw that, I'm not sure what year it was, but we saw first quarter of a year where everyone that won a tournament lost first round the next tournament you know uh, so it's kind of like do you yeah. really want to win a tournament the week before a slam yeah. or do you just want to get a few matches and get on to the slam you know what i mean that's yes. where yeah i think and i'm not sure how she did in that slam i think maybe she did lose first round right uh um, yeah yeah i think so i, I think, think so because round. she ended up playing on on monday as well yeah. and you get yeah. there and then i think the other thing that like is sort of hard to deal with that I always make sure if you had a good tournament the week before, you get to the tournament as quick as possible, get on site, let everybody pat you on the back, yeah. right? And get that up. Great job last week. Great job last week. Tough one. <laughs> Whatever it is, right? Get yeah. that all out so you can hit the reset button. Because you don't still yeah. want to be getting congratulated the day before mm -hmm. your first match. Like, it's over. You yeah. need to get hungry again. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So yeah. I always, I was looking at that scenario like, okay, is she ready for what's about to happen? Yeah, and especially being her first title at that level too, right? Yeah, so, yeah, it's, yeah. It's, uh, okay. that's interesting. So now you transition from the tour, right? So you left the tour about a year and a half ago, two years ago, and now you're working with a company called Sense Arena, which I've seen it, and I think in the spirit of, you know, we talk about how to move the game forward, et cetera. Um, we've seen other, you know, like with PlaySite and all types of other digital stuff try to come into the market. Tell us about your new venture, uh, 
or the company you work for now? Yeah, um, you know, it's been an amazing learning experience uh, with this company that I've been part of it for the past uh, almost seven months now. And, you know, what Saints Arena does and have been doing, it's, it's a virtual reality software um, that works on in-game situations that allows players to get more reps, you know, to really work on their brain, you know, those mental skills, decision-making, reaction, anticipation, visualization, all that kind of stuff. You know, we've been actually in hockey for five years. Uh, and at this point, you know, we partner with five NHL teams. Uh, we have, you know, uh, over 10 D1 schools and about 10,000 users. So, you know, it's very focused a lot also from a junior and youth perspective because their brain is developing a lot during that point, you know, from the 11 to 16 year olds, uh, we call the sponge time, you know, when they're just getting so much into their brain. Um, you know, and basically this allows you to work on really on this, what we call this part of the game of the mental side that we feel that has been neglected for a lot of years. And I feel that really it's what is being able to take players to the next level, right? I think at this point where you see, you know, technically all players have, you know, a good forehand, good backhand, good serve. And you have resources such as great coaches for you to work on that. You know, the physical part, you know, since the 80s, 90s, at this point in 2022, I would say that 95% of the players are fit that are in the pros, right? On the college level and even high level junior. And then what we see really making that small difference, right? It's, it's really getting to that mental aspect. But also, how do you get those extra reps without burning out, right? How can you go through a visualization without having to be on court and working on that return or on that passing shot or on that approach without that body tear per se, you know? So this is really what I believe virtual reality has been able to allow, you know, athletes to take to the next level and really create that longevity uh, part of it uh, as well, you know, and as you know, uh, virtual reality has been on for a really long time already, especially on high risk industries such as military, medical field, Formula One, right? And then you have the ability to now do it in sports, which I think the performance of it will increase uh, with the players, so. And so just so everybody's clear, listeners are clear, so it's basically a set of like goggles, kind of like a video game, right? Goggles, and then there's like a, a, a fake tennis racket, right? Like that sort of communicates with the goggles? Correct, yeah. So, you know, it's a headset, a VR headset. We use the MetaQuest 2. Uh, and then we are the software inside of the VR headset. And then we have a racket per se, where we put the controller on the headset that has those sensors. Uh, but, you know, it's similar weight. Uh, we have what we call haptic, which you actually feel the vibration once you make impact of the ball. Uh, an important thing here to say, it's, uh, it's not a game. It's a, it's a training tool. Okay. So I, what, what struck me about it, number one, was, you know, I think like everyone, everyone has their sort of, you know, skill set. Like, obviously, I, I've taught people from scratch, so I think I'm a pretty good technician. You know, obviously there's, there's, there's better ones like, you know, the Macy's and Saviano, those kind of people, right? Uh, but I think sort of when I first got into coaching on tour, what I thought my like, and this is not just, you know, what I felt like I could tell, like what my gift was, was helping somebody win tomorrow, right? And all right, we won today. This person won today. We're going to play them next how do I take all this video, synthesize it into like the three most important things, right? Uh, or situations, right? And what struck me about this was, man, this will be really cool if I can like take this and create, I mean, there's, there's 40 different scenarios that are gonna happen as a match happens, right? But just like, in terms of like habits, I always tell like, player don't change, the tiger don't change his stripes. When it's winning time, when it's five all deuce, when it's four all deuce, Here's what's going to happen, right? And here's what they're going to do. And that really doesn't 
change. You know what I mean? And so the way I would use this is to the the day between a slam, right? The day between matches at a slam, whatever, the night before the match, put in like the three or four most important scenarios or most common scenario that you're going to face and try to run the player through them in their hotel room or whatever. Can you do that? Like, can, can you do that with this software? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, so you will be, uh, right now we have pre-selected scenarios that, you know, you might basically cover uh, a lot of the situations that, you know, you'll want to put it out there. But we are coming up, you know, to become more and more customized. So this in 2023, early 2023, we're going to be releasing a way for you to basically create any scenarios that you as a player or you as a coach can put that uh, player to it, right? So like if it's, as you said, on the very pro level, it gets more and more specific, right? And I think, you know, but that can be applied to anyone, juniors, you know, recreational players and so on that. Just situations that either, as you said, it's my habits. And I would say it's the 21st century of visualization, right? Like, uh, you know, back when I used to play, my coaches would tell me, hey, close your eyes and imagine you going through the situation over and over again. But you can tell me, Kamal, how many juniors or even pros at this point, you know, have the ability to to do that right so like i think this is just a new form also to engage but also to create that self-esteem self-confidence on those situations that you just mentioned so to answer your questions yes we'll we're working on it and then the beautiful thing is that we're going to be releasing new features you know every couple of months that one of them includes this you know being able to go through any situation that you want uh, so we're hopefully working on on aspects of like getting that video that you just played that match and being able to watch from a first person view, right? Instead of just watching through a match and then breaking down, right? Like, okay, I want to see 30 all where did my opponent serve? How did I return, right? But then it becomes much more interactive than just watching on a computer or in your phone or television and you sending to, you know, it's long, hey, watch this 30 all points and, you know, every time and see what you did. And that's what, you know, so I think that's that aspect of tennis that we're hoping that it engages more, that it's going to at the end of the day, like creates more juniors that want to play tennis, want to continue to play tennis and increase performance, right? That hopefully that's the end goal for everyone. Well, let me, let me take it back then because you, you said it gives that the haptic feedback. And for those who don't know, it's like when you touch a touch screen, it vibrates, right? If you're in your car now and you touch the touch screen and you got to like kind of feel the vibration, that's what that is. Can you, or do you, can you program it? Like if somebody is hitting the ball late, right? Can you use it to improve someone's contact point, right? Can like, can I get in the, in the, in the video and say, okay, because you are actually swinging in these scenarios with sort of this half racket, right? Thing that's providing, that's communicating with the, yeah. with the headset. So like, can you improve someone's contact point, right? Can it be like an ah when it's late or can it be like a ding when it's, when it's early, right? Or when it's on time, you know what I mean? Yeah, um, yeah, 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 yeah. No, I, I, know, I know what you mean. Um, I think at this point, what we want to make sure, you know, like it's, the technical part, we still believe the best it is to, you know, be out there with the coach, right? That those are going to be able to translate the best to it. Uh, now, of course, you know, if you know, if you come out, told me, hey, you need to use this grip and get a little bit more in front. What allows you to do is that now you can get onto Sense Arena and create the habit of getting more in front. From, right. a, from a, just, a, just a motion repetition thing, but Correct. not necessarily receive the precise feedback on Correct. whether or not it is perfect. Got it. Yeah. yeah. Got it. Exactly. Okay. That'd be the that'd be exactly. next phase. Y'all can hire me as a consultant. That'd be your next phase. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> yeah, you're going to be on the advisor board <laughs> soon enough. And then you all have got some some pretty good players lined up. So you've got Navratilova, you got Jack Sock, uh, Jim Brady. Um, yeah. How did that come about? Were those through your tour relationships or you reached out like, hey, you know, we got to get that Jen Brady sort of 
full Western flip grip. You got to get <laughs> Jack Sock where he actually hits the forehand with the back side of the racket. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah no, next no, no, next time you need you're gonna need to speak to them uh but you know i think martina it's a czech company you know so there was that relationship uh before you know and she saw actually what was happening in hockey and she just saw you know what could happen in tennis uh, so she jumped on on board and you know help be the advisory board like how we create those drills what's the roadmap and whatnot uh, I think the current pros, uh, it's really looking at use cases, right? I think Jen Brady, she's been going through a lot, right? With her injury after, you know, last year. So coming back to tennis and then not allowing you now to go through repetitions and feel that you're immersed on a tennis court when you can actually not be there. You know, I think that was a huge part for her to speed up her recovery time. Um, Jack, you know, actually when we spoke, you know, to his agent and, and he was just pumped, you know, he saw he's a very tacky, avid, you know, he loves that part of like where the game is going. So, you know, just different um, use cases, you know, we have a couple other pros that are started using it and different ones, you know, some of them use for warm ups just before, you know, they get on the practice court or on the match, you do your whole, let's say, physical warm up. But I can remember that I, you know, as a player, sometimes you go, you do that jog, you do those stretches, you do those sprints, but you're just completely thinking about something else, right? So like if you can activate your brain, that's a beautiful thing. Some players use for recovery, right? When you're just not able to play, you know, because of an injury or also, you know, youth players. How many times I, I, I heard your, you know, you're talking to Paul, you know, and talking about like players, on the Midwest, on the Northeast, and, you know, and the issues of like just not being able to get core time because of the weather, you know, that's just another way for you to, again, feel we're not here to replace on core training, but we're enhancing now on the situations of either rain, snow, hurricane, you know, earthquake. So COVID, you still COVID, 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 COVID right. you know, uh, <laughs> we hope that doesn't happen anymore, but, if there's another pandemic, yeah, people will still be able to play. Man, well, that's that sounds fantastic. Um, well, you've been very generous with your time. I want to, you know, thank you for taking the time to come. Uh, I want to wish you luck in like your second career. Um, <laughs> you know, always enjoyed seeing you on tour. I was one of those coaches that came in and was like, "Don't play me last. Don't play us last. <laughs> Don't. If you want us yeah. to stay in a tournament? Don't play us last." So I was one of those pain the ass guys that came in and said all right come on what what, what are we gonna do let's let's argue right now about yeah, yeah. what we're gonna play on and <laughs> don't put us up for three right you know yeah. what i mean <laughs> yeah 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 no um, no no i appreciate you you having me here come on uh as you said you know like uh those relationships sometimes it comes through hard times but once you're <laughs> able to communicate and talk it through at the end of the day you know we all know that everyone's going through their own thing and uh, but it creates bonds and relationships that we keep it for a long time so i appreciate you having me here all right guys well this has been the tennis.com podcast with yannick yoshizawa former tour supervisor uh former player relations so he had to deal with all the personalities and now working for sense arena which is a vr tennis company thanks for having thanks for coming on the show bro thank you